This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Witch Digital. If you're a witchy small business owner, listen up. Are you trying to grow your business but are tired of feeling like marketing advice is written only for huge corporations? Do you wish there was a digital marketing agency made by and for people like you? Then let me introduce you to Witch Digital, a queer-owned team of marketing witches based in Virginia and NYC. Whether it's branding, a new website, or helping you make sense of social media, the Witch team has helped more than 20 small businesses in the past year alone achieve their goals. If you've been putting off hiring someone to help you with your digital marketing efforts, consider this your sign. It's time to take the first step by reaching out to the team at Witch Digital. Head on over to Witch Digital and note that Witch is spelled V-V-I-T-C-H and mention the Witch Wave to save 10% off your first service. That's witchdigital.com, V-V-I-T-C-H digital.com. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by The Spacious Tarot. The Spacious Tarot is more than a deck of cards. It is an energetic realm beckoning you to enter and explore. Many of the deck's illustrations are from a first-person perspective, inviting you into a direct experience of the tarot. And I have seen a deck myself, and it is absolutely immersive and beautiful. The Spacious Tarot deck features earthy, nature-based imagery, as well as more mystical and cosmic elements. Benabel Wen, author of Holistic Tarot and prior Witch Wave guest, says, quote, These cards are great pictorial anchors in focused meditation or as starting points in astral journeying and visionary work. Unquote. And in addition to the 78-card tarot deck, there's also an expansion pack, which is available to use with the tarot. This set contains an extra 22 cards, including zodiac signs and elements. Both decks come with guidebooks, making them suitable for beginners or more seasoned tarot readers. And best of all, Witch Wave listeners can enjoy 10% off their purchase at thespaciousTarot.com using offer code WITCH. You can also view images and learn more about the Spacious Tarot decks from their Instagram account, which is at the Spacious Tarot. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello, and welcome to the season finale of The Witch Wave. Yes, indeed, the podcast will be on a summer break before returning in September, but have no fear, I will still be doing some bonus episodes and mini-sodes roughly every other week via the Witch Wave Patreon throughout the summer, so do join us over there if you haven't already. And just a friendly reminder, I will be leading the monthly Patreon virtual ritual the day after this episode airs on Thursday, June 29th at 8 p.m. Eastern, which all Patreon members can either attend live or watch the recording of, which will be available until the next month's virtual ritual. And I'll be doing virtual rituals throughout the summer as well. So lots to tide you over with throughout the season. All of that said, 
I will be taking next week off entirely from all podcasting and hopefully from all of everything in order to give myself a much, much, much needed vacation. And starting this summer, I'm also going to be working on my next book. Yes, after much patience and persistence and a ton of spell work, it looks as though we have found a phenomenal publisher for it. And if all goes to plan, I will be announcing it officially within the next couple weeks. And eventually, I'm going to be telling you some stories about how it's all gone down because, oh my goodness, the magic that has been happening during this process of writing the proposal and then pitching the book to publishers has been so undeniable and I can't wait to share it all with you. But anyhow, I am super excited to get started researching and writing it and pretty nervous too. But I know that what I need right now is a bit of downtime to help me get ready to shift into the gear of making a whole new thing. But I am truly, truly grateful that I'm getting to do this, and I cannot wait to tell you all the details about it soon. More on that down the road. But in the meantime... Ooh, we are closing out season six of The Witch Wave with a bang because today's guest is rock star, poet, and all around polymath Sadie Dupuis. And talking to Sadie affirmed for me yet again how much I love not only musical magic, such as the kind she generates so much of with her band Speedy Ortiz and her solo project Sad 13, but also how much I love word witchery in general. Because Sadie writes some of the most intricate and incantatory song lyrics and poetry ever, and listening to her music and reading her words is, for me, a truly transformative experience. We talk a lot about all of this in our conversation, and we do a particularly deep dive on her recent book of poems called Cry Perfume, which happens to be published by Black Ocean, which some of you may know is the press run by my friend and usual occult suspect, Jonica Stuckey. Anyhow, there are so many turns of phrase in Sadie's poem tome that I'm tempted to quote like 15 of them for you right now, but I want you all to go out and get it and read it yourselves. So I will just share one favorite excerpt, and this is from her poem, Free Fall Through a Black Hole, and I just can't get it out of my head. Argent morning, trace a line with a board game wand. The sieve of myself I sift through as I see myself out. Ah, as you can hear, Sadie has a real mastery of serpentine syllables, and I love the way she takes supernatural imagery and balances it with a really rooted sensibility. And so many of her poems and songs have inspired me and empowered me because of this. She often writes about tough stuff, and as a quick content warning, she does refer to some of those traumas and experiences of abuse in our conversation. But I so appreciate how she confronts death, grief, anger, and mental health concerns in an unflinching way but does so by populating her songs and poems with spirits and crystals and witches and lucky charms. It's a perfect balance of grit and glitter that I find irresistible. Anyhow, I am so thrilled to have Sadie as my season finale guest, and I'm grateful to her for taking some time out of her truly wild schedule to join me for this chat. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on The Witch Wire. 
Who is it? Wishes. Wishes. Okay, so I thought for this season six finale episode, I would switch it up a bit, and instead of reading a listener question, I'm going to read a listener comment. Colleen writes, Hi, Pam and witchy friends of the Witch Wave podcast. I just wanted to say hi and thank you for sharing your amazing work. I always look forward to listening to the podcast. It feels like getting together with friends. I listened to the episode with Priestess Stephanie Rose Bird this morning, and I really enjoyed hearing about connecting with intuition and the earth, and I was able to reflect on it while I was paddleboarding on the gorgeous spring-fed river near my home in central Texas. I zoomed out in my mind and pictured many different witches doing their thing and connecting with nature and spirit all over the country and the earth and was reminded that we are all connected. I'm truly grateful to have found the podcast and I really appreciate you sharing your curiosity and wisdom. Aw, oh, Colleen, thank you. This makes me so happy to read because that's what this has all been about for me. The Witch Wave and my other projects have never been just about trying to have some solo platform or do some vanity projects, but rather they're about building this community and hopefully encouraging other folks to share their own magic, whatever form or flavor that magic might take. And it's been truly staggering for me to see how folks from all over the world have not only found this show, but have found each other through it. It's a wonderful witchy web we're weaving together, and I'm so grateful for everyone who listens to this show, let alone to my guests and sponsors and Patreon backers who make it all possible. So truly a big thank you, Colleen, for writing such a lovely note and also for giving me this opportunity to once again say a big thank you, thank you, thank you to this community of witches, weirdos, wanderers, and wanderers for all of the support and encouragement and good energy you've all brought my way and the Witch Waves way. And I'm so, so happy that so many of you have connected to one another's work, one another's words, and occasionally even one another in person. It really fills my heart. I'm so thrilled to close out season six on such a high, and I'm excited for us to reunite here for season seven, if not sooner. Thanks so much, Colleen. Now, on to my guest. Sadie Dupuis is the guitarist, songwriter, and singer of rock band Speedy Ortiz, whose albums include Major Arcana, Foil Deer, Twerp Verse, and their forthcoming album, Rabbit Rabbit, which is about to be released on September 1st of this year. She is also the producer and multi-instrumentalist behind the pop project Sad 13, through which she's released the albums Slugger and Haunted Painting. Magic hour burning by my side, I make the bed, it's somewhere to lie, holding a ruby in my hand, one thing in my command, I need. She's also collaborated with so many incredible artists, including Lizzo, Ben Lee, and the new pornographers. In addition to all that, Sadie heads the record label Wax 9, edits its poetry journal, and is a regular contributor to Spin, Tape Op, Talk House, and more. She holds an MFA in poetry from UMass Amherst, where she also taught writing. 
Mouth Guard, her first poetry book, was published in 2018 by Grandma. And Cry Perfume, her second poetry collection, was released in 2022 from Black Ocean. She is also an organizer with the Union of Musicians and Allied Workers and its local UMAW Philly. And she's just an all-around ingenious and incandescent human being. Sadie joined me from her bright pink Philadelphia home studio while wearing a bright pink outfit via Zoom. Sadie Dupuis, welcome to The Witch Wave. Thank you, Pam. It's a pleasure to be here. It's such a pleasure getting to finally meet you. I've been such a fan and admirer of your music and your poetry for so long. So this is a real treat. Thank you. And vice versa. So yeah. Stop it, you. (laughs) Get out of here. So listen, there are so many directions that I want to go in with you. As I told you off mic, I have five pages of notes. We can't possibly get through it all. But let's start with your most recent news, which is that there is about to be a new Speedy Ortiz album. Yep. As you just told me, this will be out on the 28th. Yep. So we'll have a a second single from the record out on that day. How fabulous. That's so exciting. It's almost like magic is in the air. (gasps) Almost. (laughs) So let's talk about this new album. I understand the title is Rabbit Rabbit. And I'd love for you to expand on how you landed on that and what your kind of, I don't know, intention is behind this album. Sure. So Rabbit Rabbit is a thing that I say at the start of every month, Pam, I think you are a practitioner as well. Yes. Um, It's a thing you say at first thing when you wake up on the first of each month to bring good luck. Rabbits have a lot of lucky connotations. And I've certainly invoked them a lot in both my poetry and my music. I'm staring at my Sailor Moon mouse pad here that has little bunny rabbits all over it. So I say rabbit rabbit every month. At some point, I started tweeting it at the start of every month, I think in like 2017. And I quote tweet myself every single time. And (laughs) once in a while, I get someone replying like, wow, I just spent two hours scrolling all the way back. Don't know what I was expecting to find. (laughs) There's no reveal. I just say it every month. Exactly. But I love having these little rituals. And as a kid... And as an adult, I had OCD, and I certainly was really into lots of little superstitions and rituals that compulsively had to do them. Yes, involuntary magic. So this is one of the few carryovers of my childhood OCD rituals that I still do. And it's not like I feel if I miss a rabbit rabbit, I'm going to be doomed for the month. But fun to have your little things you do, self-care, as they say. So I always say rabbit rabbit. And then when I started to write this record, and my writing process, I never really know where to say day one exists because I use stuff that's years old. I go to old notebooks, I go to old voice recordings, I sometimes look at old demos. But when I started to work on this record in earnest was July 1st. July is my birth month, so I, as a cancer, (laughs) like to do the whole damn month. So I started working on it July 1st, and I just titled the document Rabbit Rabbit because that's just what day it was, you Mm -hmm. know? I wasn't thinking this is the album title. So I spent all of July doing a lot of, like, pre-writing, basically, by which I mean I wasn't doing full-fledged production. I wasn't, like, building drum machine sets. I wasn't programming synth bass and all the stuff that I normally consider part of the writing process. This was, like, sitting with a guitar or a keyboard and getting progressions down, Mm -hmm. getting some melodic ideas down, getting very, very, very rough early lyrics down. And Sadie, what year was this? July 1st? Was it last year? A couple. I think it was in 2021. Okay. Uh, In fact, I know it was because I was also in the process of moving. When I first moved to Philly in 2016, I moved into an apartment that was a good size for me, but it was not a good size for two people. Mm -hmm. And my partner moved in in the pandemic. So we were really crammed. Congratulations, and I'm sorry at the same time. (laughs) That's a challenge. I mean, we've been dating a very long time, but we both tour constantly, so there was no real reason we had to live together. Yeah. So let's see. I moved seven blocks. Turns out that's a lot harder than moving states because (gasps) you think, oh, I can do it all in my little Subaru Outback. Right, right. 
So because I thought I could do it all in my Subaru Outback, we kept the lease on the old place an extra month. So this July was kind of between these two places. And I wound up doing a lot of writing in empty rooms, sitting on the floor. That was kind of a cool change of environment. I'm really getting away from the rabbit rabbit story. No, no, this is great. Let me just interject and ask you. Yeah. You do so many different things. You have your solo work as Sad 13, which I'm obsessed with, and hopefully we'll talk about your poetry. Of course, you have Wax 9, which is, what do you call it, a production company, essentially? And Mm. and It's a record label Mm -hmm. that has also done some literary publication. Great. Thank you. So I guess my question for you is like, how did you know it was time for a Speedy Ortiz album? Or did you think this might be a Sad 13 album? Like, do you even know when you're sitting down to write what the Mm -hmm. kind of output is going to be? I'm very project oriented. So definitely when I say I started writing July 1st, that was new Speedy Ortiz album time. Let's go. There was stuff that I had written or voice memoed or whatever before that. But until I know what project it's for, It's like pre-writing. I knew this was a speedy record. For one thing, I had just done a Sad 13 record that came out in the pandemic, which was its own very interesting and atypical, or I guess now typical experience as we continue to live in the pandemic. Yes. But it came out in September of 2020. So there was no touring at all for it. It was all like learning how to live stream and playing solo into the laptop camera, which I, not something I like at all. Yeah, that's the Haunted Painting album. (laughs) Yeah. So I had just done a Sad 13 record, and it had been a long time since Speedy had released a record, and even longer since we'd recorded a record, since the last Speedy record, Twerp Verse, was done in 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. Ancient history, the lineup had changed pretty drastically since then, and... At some point, it was just like, I love playing with my touring bandmates. These are some of my best friends in Philly. I'd really like to write something that we can all play together, not something that I want to record all the instruments on, not something that I'm going to have to do solo, (laughs) live stream, whatever. Yeah, I want to do something that we can go to the practice space and work on together. So I was really writing explicitly for my three bandmates and with the goal of, you know, hearing these songs live. And so... At some point, my bandmate Andy said to me, haha, we should call an album Rabbit Rabbit. I was like, it's so weird that you said that because (laughs) I have a 40-page Google Doc called Rabbit Rabbit. Wait, Andy didn't know? He had no idea. Get out of here. So uh, the kismet of him saying that was like, okay, I'm going to lean fully into this. And then on December 1st of that same year is when I dove into pre-production and made all the demos so we kind of kept with this theme of like starting on the first we announced the record on june 1st also our drummer's birthday and we've been trying to release all the singles as well on first of the month other than the one uh, coming out next week because <laughs> i think it's a what is the first a holiday or saturday or something i think it's a saturday it's july 4th weekend or something like that maybe there's some reason we couldn't do it yeah. for that one but yeah yeah and the album's coming out on september 1st of this year yes which i fought so hard for <laughs> i'm sure as you know i know it's the same in books i think it's more drastic in record pressing but production timelines are just all over the place sure because of parts and materials oh yeah i was told there's no way we'll make the september 1st deadline i was like you know what we're gonna proceed as if we can make it and if we wind up in the unfortunate position of having to push the street date which is costly and in marketing world apparently that's a huge problem i was like i don't care we need to try and it's it's working out so. there you go manifesting yeah. my friend that's excellent <laughs> yeah stubbornness and <laughs> manifesting very similar <laughs> traits <laughs> Agreed. Agreed. (laughs) So I'm so excited about the new album. I've heard the couple tracks that you've released already. It's USO2. Is that how you would say it? Okay. USO2. And then I mean, it could also just be U season two. So there's certain things that I like won't mess with. And Amazon is one of them. Sometimes like TV (laughs) shows are on Amazon and I'm like, but I still want to watch the show, but I can't give Amazon any money. Yeah. Oh, my, my partner knows how to download things. Will you download <laughs> this show for me? The USO2 very much in the like torrenting file naming mm-hmm. parlance. Oh, that's great. That's great. And then the other track I heard, Scabs, that is on the new album too. Am I yep. right? Awesome. Yeah. And so those two songs, they're so fantastic. 
Thank you. They seem thematically to operate in a similar space where you're kind of addressing like hypocrisy and frustration with people who they talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. Specifically yeah. in the the music industry, it feels like maybe it's a little bit broader, but I'd love for you to expand upon that. Yeah, it's funny. I read an interesting Twitter thread today that was about, so I have OCD and have been diagnosed for a long time. I got an ADHD diagnosis like four or five years ago. So mm-hmm. much later in life, I have the typical ADHD thing where I overfunction. Mm-hmm. So this was a thread about ADHD and burnout and maybe like the... 20th tweet in the thread it's talking about how people with adhd and autism have a particularly like visceral response to the feeling that their values are being violated or that injustice is happening and i'm like oh i thought this was just a i was on some vengeance like toxic masculinity bullshit yeah (laughs) yeah feel so enraged by the feeling that other people aren't living up to fair values or treating others with respect and decency. But yeah, apparently this is an ADHD thing too. The more you learn from (laughs) social media. Who knew? There you go. I feel like there's a thread throughout my work where I see exploitation of others and it enrages me. And the way to process that as someone who has a very flat affect, as you can tell from my monotone, is through writing something that expresses that emotion better than I'm able to. There are these two songs that came out already that are very much pro-labor and anti-union busting, anti-exploitation, not only within the music industry, but in the adjacent creative industries that have overlapping concerns. I'm a freelancer as well, so certainly all the writers' unions, all those struggles speak to my own issues in my work and those of my peers. So that's sort of where those two songs came from. But more widely, this record is like the first time I've ever written about child abuse I experienced. I've just completely avoided writing about it, thinking about it, working on it in therapy beyond what I, you know, the little I did as a child. Mm. And I've been able to not have to think about it by just like being on tour 10 months a year for the past 10 years. Yeah. So as a freelancer, I feel like I'm always learning things from commissioned work that I can bring into the things that are my own creative projects. And Mm -hmm. I love taking on different kinds of projects that are outside of my wheelhouse. And not only is it a fun challenge, but I'm like, I'll learn something that I can bring to my own work. Yeah. And I wound up doing some co-writing in the pandemic with Carl Newman from The New Pornographers. Oh, nice. It was like a really fun experience because he just sent me three instrumentals and was like, can you top line these? And I sent him back some melodies and some lyrics. But I was looking at the songs and I was like, huh, this is all about that stuff yeah from when i was a child and i've never even thought to broach this before like where is this coming from yeah and so this record rabbit rabbit is not only thinking back to some of these like early and painful and traumatic things but it's looking at how i worked around them as a child and how that led me to music and it also is zooming out to how did that set me up to accept some of the things that are unjust within the music industry and within creative industries. And how does that also make me very primed to respond with this, like, I joke, my Holden Caulfield bullshit, where I'm like, hypocrite, hypocrite, hypocrite. You're not being cool. You're being awful. Why am I so drawn to protecting others when I have not always been great at protecting myself? Yeah. We led with these two sort of pro-labor oriented singles, but the wider picture is all of those intersecting components. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just have to say that I'm so sorry that you experienced all that. And I'm so thrilled that you're able to metabolize it now and create something that is inevitably going to be fucking badass and beautiful. And I can't <laughs> wait to hear it. Thank you. <laughs> but did you find that experience of finally that dam breaking open? Was it cathartic was it healing in any way or is it too soon to say it's some of my favorite songs i've ever written and certainly when i land on something i know artists have differences of opinions of whether this is a helpful way to talk about their work and people don't want to feel that their labor is being devalued by saying oh the song just came to me but there is craft and there's labor involved in sure but i do go into that like computer fugue state yeah. where I'm like, I am programming all these drums and 13 hours have passed. And now the, where did this song come from? This is 
one of the coolest things I've been a part of, and I have no idea how I got here. Ugh. There are some songs on this record that are my favorites I've ever written, and all of that felt great. We finished this record like a year ago, and in the year between then and sending out the press release, it's the most stress I've ever felt mm. about something I've worked on because it's not that I haven't talked about difficult things that have happened to me in my life. I've talked about being a survivor of abuse in domestic relationships, mm -hmm. but talking about child abuse, there is so much like shame and stigma attached to it because you have this like tendency to protect your family and yes. the other people in your life who were not able to protect you as a child. So you're basically still like parenting yourself as yes. an adult. It just brought up a lot of really difficult stuff for me. So like the year in between writing it and like sending out that press, not sending it out, I'm not the publicist, thank God, <laughs> but saying like, yes, you can send this out. It was stressful. Yeah. And I'm thankful I have a good therapist who I could Every week be like, uh, here are the 400,000 nightmare scenarios I've imagined in the shower regarding this song that won't be out for, you know, 11 months. Exactly, exactly. Well, it takes a lot of guts and a lot of bravery, and I'm sure that you're going to help a lot of people by sharing this stuff. I mean, whenever we kind of excavate our shadows, I feel like it's such a gift for other people when we're ready, if we're ready. So Totally, uh. yeah. And I, I do feel lucky that it's not my first rodeo. I've done difficult press cycles before and have dealt with insensitive and intrusive questions. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, I'm in a better position to talk about it now than I was at any point before. So, Well, I can't wait to hear the new music. I would love to hear more about that fugue state that you entered mm -hmm. because I'm very interested in like the notion of, as you know, magic and creativity and spirituality and where they overlap. Yeah. Do you have any sort of theories around that for yourself? Like, does it feel like the songs are coming from some other space for you? What is your relationship with spirituality and creativity these days? Oh, that's so many questions. Let me think. Let me oh, think. I'm sorry. That was kind of a machine gun of questions at you. I know, but it's all it's all connected, as we know. Let me, let me go a couple places. Mm-hmm. My dad was Jewish and my mom grew up Catholic. Neither was especially religious as I was growing up, but I did go to Hebrew school and I continued to do the high holy days, more in the form of drinking and eating than going to temple. <laughs> totally. So there was like a minor undercurrent of like knowing the cultural connotations of spirituality, but I didn't grow up believing in any kind of God, nor did I really look to religion for much else than the like cultural and community aspects. But... I sang in children's choirs for like a really long time, beginning more seriously when I was around 12. And until I was 16, I was actually touring in a children's choir. Whoa. So we would do like big cathedrals and this was a non-religious choir. But of course, sacred music is so much a part of the classical and even contemporary new music compositions. So I was exposed to a lot of like beautiful religious iconography and architecture and music and timbres of like old organs through that experience. Mm. So I can't say that like music is devoid of spirituality for me because so much of my music education came from this like explicitly these religious settings, if not religious inhabitations of them. Yes. And then with regard to my own composition, I always was having just songs pop into my head when I was a little kid. I remember writing them as early as like six or seven. And it would just be I'd have a an idea for a melody and would try to figure out what to do with that. So I certainly can sit and write to other things. Like I just told you about doing top line writing for, mm -hmm. for new pornographers. I've done that for a few other artists. I love playing on other people's things and figuring out what I can bring to them. But when I'm writing my own stuff, it's just like, intrusive thought is here. Yeah. I have to conjure it into somewhere other than my head. Yeah. So most of my writing comes from that. I can certainly get handed a chord progression and write something on top of it, but the stuff I'm really excited about comes from some other place. And I always joke, my music's like annoyingly complicated and my bandmates always laugh about it because <laughs> it sounds simpler than it is, but it'll be like, oh, cool. This one measure is in a 
stupid time signature. I'm sure that comes from singing <laughs> classical music because that stuff is all like that. Measure of nine, measure of 13, measure of now you got four, four for one second, but watch out. Now you got five, now you got seven. A lot of my music does stuff like that or has clashing notes also very tied to like 19th, 20th century choral music has all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, uh, I listen to what's popular in rock music. It's like what I call gym rock, which I like. It's fun. <laughs> it's stuff that repeats. It's stuff that's not discordant. But I always joke that like, nope, the devil told me I had to do it this way. <laughs> I got to do what he sent to me. There we and go. That's, <laughs> and that's why this like weird pop rock song has all these clashing notes and uh, time signature changes. <laughs> well, it sounds fucking delicious. <laughs> On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Hallowed Haircraft. Hallowed Haircraft is a holistic, private hair studio located in Santa Clarita, California, where Deirdre Vieira practices her eclectic craft, weaving plant medicine, Reiki, shamanism, and lunar phase work into her services. She is a lifelong student of the esoteric arts and identifies as an eclectic pagan animist. Being able to use her haircraft is a way for her to bring restoration to the etheric body and to the crown of hair we wear in everyday life. Hair magic is a lost art, and using the moon phases to enhance hair appointments has become a particular passion for her. Deirdre has worked in many facets of the industry, being most proud of her work within the transgender community, as well as being a hair practitioner for those who have immune system disorders, and for her wholehearted shift into low-tox, biodynamic, and cruelty-free products and practices. She is well-versed in cold cap care and post-chemotherapy hair care, as well as high-risk pregnancy hair color services and dealing with hair loss from postpartum, anxiety, medications, and more. In her private suite, you will find a safe space to create a transformation in not just your hair, but your mind, body, and spirit. Her pricing is gender neutral, based on time and products, and she is comfortable with all texture types and welcomes a diverse clientele. You can find out more at www.halloweddhaircraft.com or via her Instagram at halloweddhaircraft. That's H-A-L-L-O-W-E-D haircraft. The Witch Wave is sponsored by BetterHelp. Listen, it doesn't matter how much magic you do or how clear-eyed and organized your plans are, there are just going to be times when you feel a little lost or uncertain about where you're going in life. It happens to all of us, and full disclosure, this has happened to me in a pretty big way recently, as over the pandemic, I had this giant project that I put a lot of time and energy into, and it just didn't pan out, or at least hasn't panned out yet. And so for a while, I was feeling really unsure about where I was supposed to be focusing my attention next, let alone feeling drained from working on something that didn't quite find its way, at least in the way that I thought it might. But what has helped me ride those waves of uncertainty and eventually to figure out my next steps was doing a bunch of spell work around it and having really good therapy. Because sometimes in life, we're faced with tough choices and the path forward isn't always clear. So whether you're dealing with decisions around career like I was or relationships, or anything else, therapy helps you stay connected to what you really want while navigating life so you can move forward with confidence and excitement. Trusting yourself to make decisions that align with your values is like anything. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. In my case, I finally figured out that I'm supposed to be writing my next book, and I'm thrilled that I'm starting this literal and figurative new chapter of my life. And therapy helped me get here. 
I have been in therapy for decades, and I truly wish everyone on earth could experience it because it's helped me manage my anxiety, it's seen me through times of uncertainty, and it has just generally helped me heal and strengthen and sort out how to try and make the best use of my time here in this life. So if you are thinking of starting therapy yourself, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. All you have to do is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with better help. Visit betterhelp.com slash witchwave today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp.com slash witchwave. Hi, witch wavers. I have exciting news. At long last, we have some new witch wave merch available for you now through Tee Public. We decided to go with TeePublic for our new Witchwave merch because it is a print-on-demand site, which means you can get different variations of the Witchwave logo printed on t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, magnets, notebooks, oh my gods, the sky's the limit. And the shirts come in different styles and fabrics and colors and are available in sizes small through 5XL, so you can order whatever you'll feel you're most magical in. So head on over to witchwavepodcast.com slash shop. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Sadie Dupuis. So Sadie, we were talking about where the music comes from and if it's perhaps a magical or spiritual experience for you. And Again, I just told you the devil makes me do it. <laughs> <laughs> Which honestly is kind of what I was hoping the answer would be. But there's this interview you gave to Auto Straddle where you have this great quote. You said, Chance and error are friends to my process, whether that's in recording music or in writing poems. And then you go on to say, if any of them, meaning these creative methods, produce a glitch in my intention, I go with it. Mm. So can you talk about embracing chance and mistakes? Because to me, there's something mystical about that. You know, I think about divination and these different processes that lots of artists have used, whether it's of like cut-ups like David Bowie did with some of his lyrics or people who use tarot cards to generate work where you're kind of like surrendering and letting what wants to come through come through. So in terms of your own attitude of embracing like mistakes and glitches, how did you learn that and why do you think it's important for your process? I think because I'm someone who likes having so much control over so many different tentacles of the creative process, If there's anything that gets me out of that and it produces something different than I could have thought to do, I have to embrace that as like a a co-writer, basically. There's this Jenny Lewis song that she did with Beck. I can't remember which one it is, but there's like some really weird vocal like hiccup in it. And it was basically a byproduct of like Pro Tools just freaking out. Like the computer's processing was overwhelmed. Yeah. And it's just like this cool sound effect that you wouldn't have got otherwise. I think about times I've been recording and I play a quote unquote wrong note and I'm like, oh, that's so much cooler than the note I actually composed. Like we got to go with that. Yeah. As much as I can be, I like to be completely in control of whatever's happening and know exactly how things are going to go and have like a very overly edited script. So if something comes up that's interesting and outside of what I could have done, I like to embrace that if it's a better option. Mm, I love that. You're 
giving me this like weird sort of sense memory. When I was a teenager, I was obsessed with poetry. I still am obsessed with poetry, but I used to go into the city to see poets I loved and you oh, know, cool. lots of like indie bands and all the cool shit that I couldn't get in suburban New Jersey. I could just hop on a train and see stuff. And when I was growing up, I was obsessed with soul coughing mm -hmm. and M. Doty, who was also a poet. I didn't know that. Yeah. I got to add that to my list of there's not so many of us. I know. And it was the first time as a young person I was like, wait, you can be more than one thing. Like you can be a musician and a poet. Like that's so mind blowing. And so how do you sort of strike that balance between your poet self and your music self? And I know that's a very open ended question. So <laughs> however you feel like answering it is great. There goes the, the howling dog. Um, <laughs> Which dog is that? That's Lavender. Oh, Lavender. I'm a she's, fan on Insta. <laughs> she's a good girl. She's part Border Collie. She looks like a pit bull, and I'm used to pit bulls who are not quite as talkative. Uh, border <laughs> Collies are incredibly talkative. <laughs> yeah, she wants to talk about poetry and music. She sure does. What did you ask me? Oh, how do I strike the balance between working on those two things? Mm -hmm. I like to work on lots of little things, and... My music is just always something I've done and songs just kind of popped into my head when I was a little kid and I felt like uh, unsettled unless I figured out how to get them on paper or then onto a cassette or then into garage band or then onto tape or whatever. Poetry was like a much later interest for me in that I took a class in college that had nothing to do with poetry. It was a class on letters with the poet Bill Corbett, who was sort of this institution within Boston poetry and, and more widely art. Sadie, was this when you were still at MIT? Because I understand yep. you started at MIT and you were super mathy, right? You were Yeah, I went for math. Amazing. I had always played in bands and had always played music and been a big fan of music. So I signed up to write for the student newspaper because I had heard you could get concert tickets if you did, which was true. And of course, it's MIT. People are overwhelmed with like more important things. So I immediately, <laughs> like one semester in, was suddenly the editor of the art section. Ah, incredible. I suddenly was like, I'm going to be a music critic. And this is what I thought I was going to do. <laughs> nice. Spent the second year at MIT figuring out how I could drop out to do that. Yeah. But I took Bill Corbett's class on letters because he wrote for the Boston Phoenix and was the arts critic. So I was like, oh, I'm sure I could learn something that would be useful for my writing about Spoon or whoever. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Spoon. So, so I took his class. He was like, you should take my poetry workshop. I was like, I don't really do that. I'm, mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm a serious music journalist. Mm -hmm. I took his class. There were like three people in the class, including me. And I have this like horrible competitive drive. And I was like, well, I'm just going to be the best poet in the class then. Fuck right. And then, of course, like most schools, I think there were some writing awards and I submitted to all of them, and I won, like, every single one. Nice. Granted, like I said, there are three people in the class. No one is taking <laughs> writing seriously at, at MIT. MIT. I mean, there were great faculty, such as Bill. Sure. Um, such as Rebecca Ferry, who's also since passed, but she taught me so much and introduced me to Bell Hooks and so many writers I still really value. Junior Diaz was, and I think still is, on faculty. The competition wasn't, like, tight, but my very praise-driven brain, which, as I get into on this album, is, like, oh, that's like a byproduct of like, you know, surviving child abuse. Yeah. Like you really seek out the things where you can be rewarded or recognized. Right. I was like, oh, I guess people think I'm a good writer. I'm going to drop out of school right now. <gasps> and I did. And I started freelancing all these different places. And when I went back to school, it was for poetry. Mm -hmm. And then I went and did my master's in poetry and was teaching writing. So I found this very different path, sort of solely based on like accidentally winding up in Bill's poetry workshop. Oh, I love that synchronicity. And you were doing music throughout, correct, Sadie? Yeah, I always have played in bands, yeah. and I always thought that would just be my fun thing that I did. And that was very ingrained in me from both parents. It is impossible to make a full-time job of music. You will do other jobs. You know, my mom's a painter. She's an artist to this day, but she had other jobs. I like that your fallback plan was like, I'm going to be a poetry professor. I know, that's so funny. <laughs> but, well, there's a little part in between it. My fallback plan was I'll be a journalist, mm -hmm. and... I kept getting magazine gigs that would then go away four months later when the entire staff was laid off yeah. or the magazine stopped publishing. And so after my 400,000th interview at a Condé Nast adjacent 
publication yeah. where, you know, I make it to the third round of interviews and then the magazine is folded. I was like, what is it? I think you get paid to go to grad school, right? <laughs> <laughs> what does it pay to go to poetry school? Yeah, And I was like, huh, this is kind of like what I'm making as a freelancer. And it's only part time. That's basically how I wound up applying to grad school. Uh, I love it. So it's like fallback, fallback, fallback. Exactly. Teaching poetry. Not to say I don't love it. I, yeah, but, uh, it seems to be working out pretty well for you. Listen, I know Speedy Ortiz, this is going to be your fourth album, and I wish we had time for us to dive into each and every one of them because I'm such a fan of each of them. But you also have these two books of poetry out. Your most recent one is called Cry Perfume, and this is actually out on Black Ocean, and listeners to the podcast and people who come to my workshops will know that Black Ocean is run by Jonica Stuckey, my incredible friend and collaborator, and just an unbelievable occult poet in his own right. So shout out to Jonica. But I'd love for you to talk about Cry Perfume, because it's such a gorgeous book of poetry. When did you start working on this book? And what made you decide it was time for a second poetry book? Yeah, it's funny. You asked me, like, how do I know what what is what a different project? And I just gave this like very pragmatic response about like how I wound up going to <laughs> a poetry MFA. Yeah. The first book I wrote was my thesis for that MFA. Mm -hmm. That's Mouthguard. And it was written over this three-year period while I was in this program, which is this like very wonderful, but very artificial construction that is not conducive to creative work for most of your life. It's like, that's the luck of getting to do one of these programs. You get sort of this, the structure and community that don't necessarily exist outside of, especially when it's funded. Totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> so it's not to say I felt like that book was all over the place, but I wasn't like writing towards that book when I was writing those poems. Yeah. I didn't know what the book was. It's very much like a collection. Mm -hmm. So I finished up the manuscript for it. And the last year I was in the MFA program was just incredibly stressful because for the first time in my life, people liked a band I was in. Mm -hmm. um, and we were starting to get offers that we could not say no to because they were with my heroes. It was like the Breeders. It was Ugh. like Stephen Malkmus. Ugh. It was like Thurston Moore. Stop it. And yet I have to teach two classes and also take my own classes and also be working on my thesis and do office hours and grading and all this stuff. Wow. So I made it work for a while, but I was so exhausted and we would be using any day off I had to tour. And it was very exciting, but it's like not sustainable to live like that. Which album was this that when things started really blowing up for you and you were teaching? Major Arcana and sort of the lead up to it. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, like from the first thing I did with this band, I was shocked that my old bands would get on someone's blog and I'd be very grateful, but it would be like that results in two more people coming to your show and it's the author of the blog. Yes. And like her husband, <laughs> you know. Totally. So when I was suddenly like, huh, like the Boston Phoenix, the Boston Globe, like Nylon, like yep. all these things that I hoped to get bylines in but never thought would cover my bands suddenly are saying like best new band of Massachusetts is Speedy Ortiz. I'm like, what is happening oh, to me? God, I love that album so much. Sadie, I hope it's not tiresome <laughs> to have to talk about one of your earliest albums, but that album no, no. is so fucking good and talk about like magical, but also so ferocious and beautiful. I love that album. Thank you. So yeah, it was going well. And I was like, I think I have to quit my job. I think the income from the touring I'm doing on my days off is actually the same as my teaching stipend from the yeah. university. So yeah. if I just quit that and tour all the time, I'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. Right on. I finished my thesis from a tour van in Europe. I flew home to defend it and then flew back to tour. Ugh. Then I was like, cool, I'm putting this in a drawer and I am not going to think about it for quite a while. Yeah. And so that book didn't come out until 2018. I wrote a couple poems after finishing up my MFA, but I was just so burnt out from pursuing both poetry and music at such a overly full-time level for so many years in a row that I just kind of didn't 
do much poetry for a few years. Mm -hmm. I wrote a couple poems. I think Jubilat was like, we would like this many pages of poems. And I was like, cool, I will write that many pages <laughs> yes, of poems. Yes. But I wasn't writing for my own self. I was just taking in the bizarre experience of suddenly being a full-time professional musician, which I never anticipated in my life. Can I pause you just for our listeners? Yeah. So a couple more albums came out both for, you know, Speedy Ortiz and Sad 13, your solo project, yep. before this new book of poems, Cry Perfume. Exactly. So what brought you back to poetry then? I started to write poetry again around 2016, and that was just from the use it or lose it mentality, mm -hmm. where I was like, I spent so much of my life with this as like the thing I thought I would pursue and the thing that I love and the thing I still enjoy reading if I don't start writing some again and I don't start carving out time for myself to write despite being on the road, then I will just cease to be a poet, which is not true. That's not of like Of course a... not. And P.S., Sadie, you write some of the most poetically intricate and gorgeous lyrics ever. So I feel like you were expressing that side of yourself anyhow in the music, but I know it's a slightly different muscle or at least a slightly yeah. different kind of way of using that muscle when you're writing purely for the page. And I think I'd also started to, maybe 2016 is when I met Dorothy Alasky finally, <gasps> who'd been one of my biggest influences. Uh, Dottie, she's a friend. She's a friend of yeah. the pod. I cannot say enough good things about Dorothy Alasky. Please keep going. Gush, gush, Dottie's gush. Dottie's a, a good buddy at this point now, too. Oh. I think I met Melissa Broder around that time. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, my music is helping me to meet my favorite poets. <laughs> and yet I'm not writing poetry at all. I guess I should like fix that. So I started to write the second book, Cry Perfume, very slowly around that time. And then the first book didn't come out until 2018. And it sort of, again, I just kind of stumble into things. Some of the really big picture things happen almost by accident. Mm -hmm. I ran into a friend, Colleen Berry, when I was on tour in Seattle. She'd been doing a small press that had done a couple friends' books. It was called Mount Analog, and the mm. first one they published. It was like stills from The Bachelor done in a sequence to be like a poetry art book. It was really cool. <laughs> nice. Uh, called Final Rose. <laughs> Excellent. By Holly Theoharides. And my friend Ted Powers, who I went through the MFA with, and he's one of my favorite poets. He'd done a book with Mount Analog. So I was like... Oh, yeah. Like we were talking and she was like, would you want to do a book? I was like, you know, I've got a book burning a hole in my desk. So we had talked about doing it together for that. And then she got hired by grandma as an editor. And so I wound up publishing it with them instead, which was great. It was a really cool press. Mm -hmm. And then it was like the press was owned by an arts foundation, owned by a couple who divorced. And then in the divorce, the arts foundation had to go away. <laughs> and then so did the press. Yes. It happened like a month after the book came out. And we sold through the first pressing like in that month. And I was like, wait, we sold the book out. Like, what? <laughs> and the press is folding? <laughs> and their catalog got acquired by Black Ocean. And that's how I met Jonica. Right on. Sadie, can I invite you to just read the first poem from Cry Perfume? It is so beautiful, yeah. just by way of introduction to this gorgeous, gorgeous tome. <laughs> I forgot. This is my, like, disgusting tour copy. And I opened, I was like, why is there a frowny face in here? I think <laughs> I'd been somewhere with a stamp, and I stamped it to be, like, a little fake. I love it. And, and just so listeners know, it is filled with... Are those post-it notes or... Post-it notes, it's whatever yeah. reading I did last, and now I'm going to have to reconfigure them to do my reading tonight. Amazing. So. Okay, the first poem is called Fake Blood on a Fake Fur Coat. On a dark ride with my devious nature, what can I manifest? Filling hole after hole. Blue flame for power. Black flame for tender. Days of uncleanliness patterned like a remedy. One gnat for the drinking glass. Dried onion on the stairs. It's the second month of the year and the second hour after midnight. Make your land uncomfortable if you really want to leave. But I really want to wait out the puffy endlessness. Hands in the holes in the satin pockets. Deep silk of uncharacteristic weather which never again changes, only my ego, and it's splattered. Yes. 
beautiful. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for picking that one. Oh, I love it. So this book is organized in different segments. Am I correct? They're sort of like invented names of imaginary perfumes. Is that right? In some cases, they're actual perfumes. Oh, right on. Yep. In most cases, they're either a perfume or a slight mistranslation of a perfume. I love it. And you have this kind of like synesthesia thing going on where there's also a color involved. So one section is black number. You have violet noise, green spell, red arsenic. It goes on. Mm -hmm. What made you decide that that would be the organizing principle for this book? I'm so funny about sectioning poetry books. With the last book, Grandma really wanted it in sections. I was like, I have certain aesthetic things that don't make sense and I just know they bother me. And so I don't want to include them in my own work. Yeah. So I just like don't want a numbered section for some reason. Yeah. Can't explain it. So in, in the case of this book, it was initially just one long section. And I sent this to a couple friends for edit advice and Dottie was one of them and not only did she tell me that's a stupid choice she, <laughs> she doesn't talk like that no she doesn't the translation in Sadie brain is that's a stupid choice it was a stupid choice and she also was like you put all your quippy funny ones as the first like third of the book and then all the weird long ones are in the middle and then all your really like sad sappy ones are in the end this is a crazy way to organize <laughs> again this is not how Dottie said it this is how I translated the advice into Oh, I'm action. sure Dottie said it with all the exuberance and color yeah. and while wearing giant, amazing Technicolor earrings. Like So Dottie was like, print the whole thing out. I'm like, I'm looking over. There's a huge box over there. It's every time I printed it out mm. 4,000 times. Mm. I'm like, I'm a million steps ahead of you. Print it out, spread it on the floor, write on each poem what the themes are, any theme you notice see what the big ones are and then try to organize it that way. And so when I did this, of course, there's a ton of overlap. And I already knew what the book was about, which is in part about uh, losing friends to overdose, mm. in part about learning about harm reduction, in part about that understanding and that grieving process, recontextualizing my relationship with the music industry, in part about labor organizing within the arts, helping me to understand the intersections between tech and text exploitation of arts better. Mm -hmm. So there's like these kind of themes. Yeah. And I came up with the, the five themes, which were like grief, sound, tech, intoxicants, and just night. Because mm. uh, it's a nightlife worker that's it's going to be there. Sure. But those are like the worst. What if I called the sections, those titles, <laughs> be the stupidest, be worse than numbers. <laughs> so um, I think... Rachel Syme is a writer whose work I like. I really like her writing. Yeah, yeah, she writes for The New Yorker and writes a lot about perfume. Incredible perfume expert and always doing this thing on, on Twitter called like Perfume Genie where you say like a mood you're feeling or a book you're reading and Rachel's like, here's a perfume about that. Yes. So I hit up Rachel and was like, where do you learn about this? And got sent some links. And then I made sort of just like a wider post like who knows about perfumes i'm looking for some cool perfume names because i had this title cry perfume already and this sort of idea that in displaying your grief that's kind of what you're doing displaying your grief in art commercial art is this sort of weird thing where you are crying a perfume it smells wonderful and it sure does sting coming out mm -hmm. so a couple friends sent me perfume blogs weirdly a lot of my like punk friends my sober punk friends explicitly know a ton about perfumes like jeff rickley sent me all these perfume blogs and every time i see him he's like here's what i'm wearing how interesting bill from clipping sent me some perfume <laughs> blogs it was like it was coming from all sides Ugh. It was like a disproportionate amount of research for the task at hand, as we've both discussed. Just like, I love reading about perfume, though, because it's like trying to put words to something that's so ephemeral and transcends language. So, And not only the writing about perfumes, but the histories of their inventions oh, are yeah. so filled with like murder, intrigue, backstabbing. Yes. It's wild. Yes. These titles are all either names of perfumes that I translated or that I mistranslated. Like black number is, number noir does not mean that, mm -hmm. but black number is a better stand in for grief. Gorgeous, gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. 
Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab is a specialty fragrance house currently celebrating its 20th year, now based in Philadelphia. Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab specializes in formulating body and household blends with a dark, romantic, gothic tone. And over the years, they've collaborated with so many of my heroes, including Neil Gaiman, Guillermo del Toro, and the Jim Henson Company. They continually return to inspirations drawn from history, mythology, literature, pop culture, and fine art, and they have a sister store called Twilight Alchemy Lab that creates oils blended and consecrated specifically for use in witchcraft and ritual magic. Keep up with their latest seasonal perfume releases by looking them up on social media. And Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab also now has a YouTube channel where they share scent reviews, announcements, and original video art. Perfume archives and customer reviews going back many years can be found at the fanrun bpal.org web forum. And of course, you can order all of Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab's decadent perfumes, oils, and more at blackphoenixalchemylab.com. Are you looking for a magical place to shop and hold space? Check out Ritual and Shelter in Homewood, Alabama. Ritual and Shelter aims to normalize the taboo topics of witchcraft, sex therapy, and plant magic through a vast variety of reading material, magical tools, and networking opportunities. With over 600 books on a wide range of topics, customers are welcome to sit in the store's reading section as they browse through historical manuals of spellcrafting, witchy women's biographies of magical societal movements, or reading modern perspectives on occult philosophy. And if you find yourself in Ritual and Shelter's reading area, you might as well check out their tarot selection. With over a hundred different tarot cards and oracle decks, each customer has the opportunity to find a divinatory system that is just as unique as they are. And if you're already in the mood to get a tarot deck, why not pair it with a crystal? At Ritual and Shelter, you will find a variety of ethically sourced stones and minerals. From pocket stones to pyramids, selenite skulls to tourmaline towers, Ritual and Shelter will go out of their way to make sure you find just what you're looking for. And as a sex-positive space, you'll also find high-quality sacral chakra stimulators guaranteed to get you in touch with your personal power. Now, if you're not in the area and you're not able to check out the Southern Gothic charm of Ritual and Shelter in Homewood, Alabama, no need to fret. You can visit their website, ritualshelter.com, to find all of the glorious products mentioned, as well as tonics, tinctures, teas, and brews. But if you are lucky enough to pass through their town, you are in for quite a treat. As a smaller and newer store, Ritual and Shelter aims to have face-to-face -face personal connections to create memorable and in-depth experiences. Walk into a space right out of a gothic renaissance novel, ooh, that sounds gorgeous, with walls as black as night, lined with shelves full of herbs, black chandeliers of the darkest elegance, and two private rooms for the witchiest of activities. And if you're lucky enough to show up on a full moon, Ritual and Shelter holds gatherings at every espit for community rituals and ceremony. So go ahead and lather up that flying ointment and travel down to Ritual and Shelter in Homewood, Alabama. Would you like even more Witch Wave? Do you wish you could hear from me and my other bewitching guests on a weekly basis? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards for some tiers also include magical merch and contests where you can win witchly prizes each month, as well as early heads up about my workshops before they sell out. 
And all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly online rituals and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witch wave witches around the world. So head on over to patreon.com slash witch wave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thank you so much. Got a rose haze for the nightshade and some bubble gum for your pal. Our SVP to be not going out, going out. So just chasing the ghost of a good time. Gets you caught up in the rewind. Chasing the ghost of a good time. Start to regress to a past. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today, I'm speaking with Sadie Dupree. So, Sadie, I want to pivot back to some of the themes that you write about in your work. Clearly, I'm biased. This is The Witch Wave. And so, (laughs) you know, of course, you write about a lot of different things. But I'd love to circle back to some of the, like, supernatural and occult themes that seem to pop up in a lot of your writing, both in your music. and I know. I can't help myself. (laughs) And in your poetry. So where does that interest come from? And what is your relationship like with, I'll just broadly say, magic from not necessarily a process standpoint, but from a thematic standpoint? Yeah, I mean, I'd say that my mom would be the first to self-identify as a witch. So (laughs) growing up, she had all kinds of books on astrology, numerology, tarot, mythology, and spell books as well. So I remember even doing some little spells with her when I was in elementary school. She sounds awesome. My mom's so cool. Awesome influence on me and uh, an artist whose work I really admire. So I always was interested in things like this because of my mom's influence. My mom telling me, like, people are acting this way because this is what the moon is doing today. Yes. That undercurrent has always been part of my life and my set of interests. You know, I only can say this with the hindsight of being an adult who knows more about mental health, but I feel like my early interest in horror probably stems from the OCD stuff Mm -hmm. where I always had, like, weird, intrusive, scary pictures or images or thoughts. And so I started to like horror movies at a pretty young age. My favorite, favorite movies still are like horror comedies. Like I saw the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. I must have rented that 100,000 times. Nice. Beetlejuice. Oh, yes. They're doing a sequel to Beetlejuice. I don't know how to feel about it. Michael Keaton's in it though, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be great. Let's hope so. He's a wonderful actor. Oh, he sure is. He created one of the best characters of all time. Yes, agreed. So I've always loved horror movies. I also always loved ghosts and (laughs) have believed in ghosts and wanted to visit haunted places. And my mom lives near a literal ghost town that is maybe of some repute. Dudley Town, have you heard of this? No, tell me more. Where is that? This is in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. It is a town that was struck by all kinds of bizarre tragedies over like a 300 year period as many like colonial towns did. Yeah. Who's to say if it was deserved? (laughs) But the like scientific explanation for why so many people like went mad or murdered each other in this town is probably that there is lead in the water supply. Mm -hmm. My mom taught at the Cornwall like public school and it's very near there. And this was like our famous ghost town growing up. Right on. In promoting Ghostbusters I think in Playboy, Bill Murray had said, like, this is the most haunted place in America. (gasps) Whoa. A lot of this stems from the Warrens, which is, you know, of course, controversial. Is it actually haunted at all? But people go there. People make satanic pilgrimages to do weird stuff at Dudley Town. Wow. Like, I've been there and found weird animal bones that aren't supposed to be there. Wow. I have not heard of this. I'm going to have to do some uh, research into this. And so for many years... This is near all these public parks. It's near like a ski slope. It's near tons of stuff. But if you were to go up the road that leads to these woods that just have ruins, basically, the police are there immediately. And this is like small rural New England. The police don't have anything else to do. (laughs) Yeah. And all the roads surrounding it are called Dark Entry Road because the area is preserved by the 
Dark Entry Forest Association. What? There's so much to this that, of course, as a 15-year-old, you're going to become obsessed. And I'm clearly still obsessed. Oh, my God. I was going to say, I'm obsessed with this now. I'm a middle-aged lady. That's incredible. So I was always going to Dudley Town, taking pictures. Oh, my God. There's orbs in the photos. So I always loved this stuff. And then when I went to MIT, I lived in this dorm that is now closed and it was a big controversial thing but it was founded on this principle of like students are doing what they need to take care of themselves as long as they're not harming someone else let them do what they want to do so drug use was not allowed but looked the other way which i thought was like a cool philosophy and principle and of course like now as a harm reductionist i can see why I identified with the policy here. But I feel like this weirdly led me into like learning a little bit about Levain Satanism. Yeah. Not a mode that I particularly subscribe to these days. Same. But as an 18, 19, 20 year old, I was like, oh, yeah, I, I guess I'm a Satanist. <laughs> like that all makes sense. Yeah, right. So I think in learning about that, I started to be interested in reading other occult philosophies and sort of growing my own witchy section of my bookshelf which includes your book waking the witch thank you it's just like yeah i love horror i love and believe in ghosts and i love reading about occult philosophies so yeah you know one of the things i love that you do with your poetry and your lyrics is that you take these supernatural elements but they also feel really grounded and beautiful and that's kind of my favorite thing that kind of alchemy between magic but also like the material like your music doesn't just feel very like up here airy fairy it's super duper grounded and speaking of ghosts i'm gonna do an annoying thing where i quote (laughs) your lyrics to you but um oh my god i I actually am cringing already when i do this and you probably know i'm like matching my my pink wall (laughs) (laughs) but As I said, I so love your solo albums that you do under the moniker Sad 13. And you have this one song called Ghost of a Good Time, which is one of my favorites, which to me feels like an introvert's anthem. I don't know if that's Uh like how you think of it. You have this beautiful section of it. I mean, the whole song's gorgeous. And correct me if I've misprinted any of this. The lyrics go... Now I hoof to the garden, hope lilacs <laughs> pop through, heavy fog, mistook for aura, casting light not pink or blue, traded most of my vice for botanical muses, scared but not clueless. And then you go on to sing, chasing the ghost for a good time, they're all by my side when I'm inside, so come on over. Did I get any of that wrong? This is... I don't know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. Oh my God, and I'm so embarrassed it's like when you too. Wa- the word, it should be so cool when I walk in somewhere and my own music is playing, but I like immediately Wanna start die. to like tear up. I'm like, oh no, I, I can't get my watch. And I feel 85 um, years old no, no, like, I reading it. your words to you. But anyhow, I love it. And everyone, please just like erase what I just did from your mind and go listen to those actual <laughs> songs. It's so much more beautiful than I could do it justice. But the point I'm trying to make here is like you're taking these ghostly supernatural images and also kind of witchy and lush images but to me this really does feel like this song about turning away from extroversion and bad influences and maybe overindulgence and things yeah is that right that's a hundred percent that was one of the last songs i wrote for that record which is called haunted painting My first poetry book, Mouth Guard, is very much like thematically related to Major Arcana because I was writing them at the same time so that I can see the words aren't repeated, but the themes for sure are because I'm one person who only ruminates on so many (laughs) pointless things. (laughs) The Cry Perfume book and the Haunted Painting album are very much similar thematically in that I'm grieving uh, friends lost to overdose. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing that album, I got... I had OCD as a kid and was told, like, you don't have that anymore and then got re-diagnosed. Of course, I still have OCD. Like, <laughs> look at everything about my life. <laughs> so I was sort of writing through a lot of those themes. And while a lot of the music was, like, fun sounding, it, it's, like, heavy stuff. And finishing up the record, I was, like, I was listening to, like, Charlie XCX, one of my f- favorite things. I love pop music. I love really stupid pop music. And I always want to try to channel some of that. And there was no, like, fun party song on this yes, album yes. that is from my supposedly pop project. I used to party, but I kind of don't now. And I'd recently 
I'd stayed over at a friend, my friend Lucy, who played in Sad 13 and has toured with Speedy as our TM. Uh, Lucy Stone, also a great Philly musician. I'd been over to her house and we'd stayed up all night watching this show Marianne, like a Netflix French horror movie. It's like, it's pretty stupid. But I was like, this is the best night of my year. We stayed up and watched this stupid, Uh, scary show. I was like, I'm going to write a party song about that. That's sort of where that song came from. That's ideal. You're speaking right to my soul with this, an (laughs) introvert's party anthem. I love it. You brought up your pop project and party music. I have to bring up your collaboration with Lizzo. I know. There's two of them, if you can believe it. Are there really? I just know the one. She did a remix of a Speedy song, too. Oh, of course. I actually knew that. Forgive (laughs) me. So this is a song you did together called Basement Queens. It's so good. It's so joyful. And I was watching the video of the making of this. It sounds like this was like you guys were sort of put together to do this. Like, how did this song come to be? So we were already working on the remix together when this came up. And I think it's like somehow an extended ad for Google Hangouts, which weren't as much of a thing then. Mm -hmm. This is like 2015. And they're like, we want to make a thing showing that you can use Google products to like make a song. (laughs) Like, would I have said yes to this now? I don't know. At the time, I was just like, yeah, sure. That sounds like why not a bunch of money to make a song that I can do whatever I want with. Yeah. They were like, and we want you to work with another artist. And we were already in touch with Lizzo for this other thing. I think we roped Lizzo into this. And she, at that time, was like, I just really like freestyling. Will you just build? (laughs) Of course, I had visions of her like doing flute on it. (laughs) Amazing. This is earlier in her career. And she was definitely more like she'd been in punk bands and Mm -hmm. was like, your band sounds like Mars Volta. And I was like, yes. See, that makes me love her even more. She's got like the rock background and cred. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of wrote something based on what her music sounded like at that time, which is pretty different from what it sounds like now. And I think it's really hard to find her. Like Lizzo Bangers was the record Mm -hmm. that I really got into. Mm -hmm. It's like hard to find it now. Yeah, But so I kind of wrote it about that. And there's like a Speedy Ortiz album zero. (laughs) Rabbit Rabbit's our fifth album. But there's an album that I did solo before the first full band one. Oh, I know. Um, And And I I love it. (laughs) And isn't it kind of two albums? I mean... There was an EP as well. Right, okay. I started this project because my band before this, before Speedy, I was in a band with a producer engineer, so he helmed all of that stuff. And I was like, oh, but I like home recording. I have no way of doing it. I guess I should start something I can use for home recording. And then, of course, that was the thing that became popular, so it became a full band, and none of the future recordings were like done by me and I missed having that outlet so I kind of wrote the Lizzo song about like being so excited to be back at the producer's chair yes yeah going into my little basement studio to make a thing the basement's where the magic happens come on my bandmates joke is my haunted attic this pink room I'm in is my studio, <laughs> but it's on the top floor. But I've always, you know, had a basement studio or practice space or something like that. So that that's sort of what the song with Lizzo became about. And she did freestyle it over Google Hangouts, but because of the lag yeah. was really bad back then. So it yeah. was like a full beat, like quarter note behind where I was hearing it. And so she did it. And I was like, right. wait, what the fuck? You're coming in early. We just like dragged what she did for her. The whole track. Maybe not the whole thing, oh but like goodness. it was funny introduction to how lag makes long distance collaboration interesting talk about that glitch, glitch magic. magic love it she's so pro and was then and now is like the biggest artist in the world and it's much deserved agree agree listen we just have a couple minutes left together and i know i keep circling back to your solo work i love speedy ortiz let me just say that but Sad 13, like some of those songs are just deeply, deeply precious to me. I mean, but you know what's so funny? Every time Speedy does something, the comment section just like takes it as an opportunity to be like, thank God, because I really don't like the Sad 13 stuff. And I'm like, oh, it's not that different. <laughs> I'm obsessed with like, both. Thank you. 
But I just, I super duper love Sad 13 as well. You have this song on the first album from Sad 13 called Slugger, called Coming Into Powers. And this has become a personal anthem for me for a lot of reasons, but particularly at this moment in my life, and I won't bore you with what's going on, but I have some reason that I keep coming back to this song to like just psych myself up and rev myself up and try to, you know, ask for what I'm worth and all those things. I'm honored. So. I love it so, so deeply. I mean, do you maybe want to recite some of the <laughs> lyrics or do you want me to embarrassingly read it to you again? You're testing my memory. I can barely remember to play a concert. So yeah, you should read them. <laughs> okay. I'm going to just say you have segments in this that, I mean, the whole thing speaks to me, but one segment that I love is, I want a life where I can be who I like. Look at me, looking back at me, recognizing who I see. And then you go on to say, horoscopes anticipating the next life will act the ways we like. I don't even remember. Those are good. (laughs) I I wouldn't have remembered them, but I like it. It's so funny. So you have to like re-memorize your songs before you tour, I guess. I have to relearn everything every time. Even like guitar parts. Amazing. That's even harder because I play such weird chords. I'm like, what? What is that sixth note in there? (laughs) That's great to know. I guess I just wanted to ask you, you know, in the song you're talking about in your next life, you'll get to be what you want to be. But it strikes me that you're someone who's doing that in this life right now. Does it feel that way to you? Because I admire you so much as someone who seems to be, I'll say, at the height of your powers in so many ways. You're expressing yourself so brilliantly through all these different mediums. You're so fucking good at all of them. And I'm just such a huge fan and I'm so grateful for what you make. It's really fortified my life and inspired me so much. So do you feel as if you can really own some of your power now? Am I the speaker of that song? I'm not sure. I think in some ways that song was about feeling the values I espouse and that my friends espouse are not always reflected in a wider culture, whether that's like how much labor deserves to be compensated and that there shouldn't be a gender disparity in how labor is compensated. And that record came out in 2016, I think. Is that true? Yeah. That song's about like, you know, not seeing the like sex positivity and the queer inclusivity and other things that like are true of me and my community, um, feeling like those values were not being reproduced in a wider cultural sense so it wasn't so much about like i don't know if i can be who i want to be it's like people are literally not allowed to be who they are and that was sort of the sentiment i think when i was working on that song although it's so hard to say what i even like it did this morning versus what i wrote (laughs) eight years ago but it's funny you pick out that song because that's the one that has samus on it right so anango's Mm -hmm. a, a great friend another like brilliant producer writer academic I was really grateful to have her on that song. And she's toured with both Sad 13 and with Speedy. But live, I was like, I don't know if I'm prepared to like be playing a set and just have like my friend's disembodied voice like rapping at like the crowd. Um, So I was like, (laughs) let me like put another sample in there. This is before I became friends with Dottie. I found like a YouTube reading that she did. I can't remember what poem, but I put it in Ableton and would just like manipulate it live. And that was what would happen in place of Samus's verse. So Dottie is like a guest on that song and live performances across 2016, 2017, beyond. (laughs) How fabulous. So how do you know? I guess you must have some uh, magical powers or something. Some kind of intuition, maybe. Well, listen, I cannot wait for the new Speedy Ortiz album. I can't wait to catch you on tour. I know other folks are going to want to do that, too. What's the best way for people to find out what you're up to and when? You can go to SpeedyOrtiz.com for the tour stuff. And then I am on socials at Sad13, which is... SAD13. You would not believe how many times people are like, I didn't get that that is like Sadie. Sadie. Or they'll say, like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I thought it was pronounced Sadie, but it's Sad13. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's where to find me. Awesome. Well, I'm so glad I found you in my life. You are just magic to me. So thank you so much for everything you make. And thank you so much for taking the time to speak with so me. So excited to speak with you today. I can't even believe I had like a witch question for you and I didn't even ask it. I'll hold on to it. (laughs) Okay, you know where to find me. Thank you so much, Sadie. Be well. 
That's it for the show, and that's it for season six. Thank you again to Sadie Dupuy for sharing her luminous artistry with me, and I hope you all have a restful and radical summer. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on The Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is a phantasmophile production written and produced by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was recorded and edited by Josh Wilcox and myself. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Our new Witch Wave logo was designed by Thunderwing. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Lara Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and give us lots and lots of sparkly stars. It really, truly makes a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchWavePod, and you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider ordering my book, Witchcraft, and or picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which are both available everywhere now. And if you want more WitchWave or you would just like to support the show, please join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witchwave.